Zenitsa's passion has been how to uh, implement genomics at scale, at a national scale, uh, and to do it as quickly as possible. Um, so Zenitsa, over to you. And I'm not seeing Zenitsa. Uh, hello. Thank you, Catherine, for the very kind introduction. What I'm going to talk about is how we have implemented a number of GA4GH standards, tools and frameworks in Australian genomics in the real world to accelerate rare disease diagnosis. Next slide, please. So the Australian Genomics um, Health Alliance is a collaborative research partnership involving more than 80 organisations and 400 researchers from all around Australia, and we're committed to accelerating the implementation of genomics within the Australian healthcare system. We're also very proud to be a GA4GH driver project, and you will find us involved in all of the work streams working towards the development of new standards. But importantly, we're also very keen early adopters of standards, tools and, and frameworks and putting them to the test in the real world so that we can drive that continuous refinement. We're also very um, keen contributors to the learning community that is the Genomics in Health Forum, and we're very keen um, to share our experience and knowledge with others, but also importantly, learn from them. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk about is how we have implemented a number of standards, tools and frameworks within one of our um, clinical studies. And that's the Acute Care Genomics Project. So this particular study is piloting a national approach to implementing ultra rapid genomic testing uh, for babies and children admitted to intensive care units with suspected genetic conditions. We have been running since 2018 and have received over $10 million worth of research funding we now recruit from all the states and territories around Australia, including all children's hospitals. In the initial phase of the program, we used trio hole exome sequencing, but over the past couple of years, we have um, transitioned successfully to trio hole genome sequencing. Our time to report, so from receiving samples at our laboratory to issue, issuing a clinically accredited result, um, it runs at just under three days. And we achieve a diagnosis in around 50% of babies and children tested. Of those who receive a diagnosis, about 75% experience a subsequent change in management, and that may be access to life-saving treatments or avoiding unnecessary investigations and sometimes surgeries and shortening length of stay in intensive care. The results of the first 100 patients tested through the program were published last year in JAMA, but I'm not really going to spend much time talking about the outcomes of the program, but much more about how we've organized and optimized our workflows using GA4GH standards. Next slide, please. We have shamelessly um, adapted this diagram for, from GA4GH, but it just depicts the typical journey of a family and their data through our program, starting with the identification of babies and children who would benefit from testing in intensive care units, through to co collecting clinic, relevant clinical data and consent, um, running the test through our diagnostic laboratory and issuing a diagnostically accredited report, and from there sharing the data for ongoing research and all the different points at which we have um, adopted various standards. In designing this workflow, we really had two main objectives. In the first part of the journey, our main objective really is to speed up um, and create a very efficient workflow so that all the information um, flows as quickly as possible through the system and we're able to result, return results really fast to families and treating clinicians. But after that, our main objective has really been to have the data in interoperable formats so that it can be um, shared for research use um, so that we make the most out of this data. And that may be in order to develop new analysis methods, for example, or contribute to natural history studies in rare disease or contribute to gene discovery, because we know that through this ongoing process, we actually improve our chances of making more diagnoses for rare disease families in the future. Next slide, please. So starting with the initial part of this journey, um, and that's collecting the relevant clinical information to inform the analysis, we have switched over to an electronic test ordering process for our clinicians. Um, 
that looks fancy but is actually built out of REDCap um, using a number of plugins which are publicly available and very happy to share. One of the plugins that we have is to do human phenotype ontology, so that allows clinical features to be captured using a standard format. We also have a plugin for the human ancestry ontology, again, um, allowing us to capture ethnicity information. And Orion from Phenotips very kindly shared an electronic pedigree drawing tool with us, which we have also incorporated, replacing um, a scanned PDF of um, a hand drawn family tree. Incorporating that has actually in turn allowed us to be very active contributors to the development of the new pedigree standard from GA4GH. Next slide, please. The electronic test order also links automatically to Panel App Australia, which Catherine mentioned in her talk. So this is a, an open online platform that allows information about the relationships between genes and disease to be evaluated uh, using an evidence-based framework and to use those individual assessments then to build, for example, virtual um, gene panels that can be used to drive the analysis of genomes for, for different clinical indications. So for example, epileptic encephalopathy or mitochondrial disorders. The panel app platform was originally developed by Genomics England for the 100,000 Genomes project, and they very kindly made that open source and helped us set up our own instance. So switching again from a, a bunch of Excel spreadsheets to this standard um, open format has allowed us to harmonize our efforts in this area, particularly with Genomics England. And as Catherine mentioned, um, the outcomes of that process have recently been published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. But it has also allowed us to interact and contribute much more broadly to global gene curation efforts through the Gene Curation Coalition, for example, continuing to build collaboratively this evidence base that allows um, more accurate and faster analysis of genomic information. Next slide, please. We have also switched our consent um, to an electronic um, format, and this is aligned with the data use ontology from GA4GH. Next slide. So what has that what have those improvements in clinical data capture meant for us on the ground? Um, we've basically replaced four or five or six different fillable PDFs and Excel spreadsheets that we used to use to capture clinical information with, with, with this much more streamlined process for which our clinicians are extremely grateful. Um, the, the whole process is very fast and we are a little bit competitive. Um, so we have timed ourselves and the shortest time um, to complete all of this sits at around four minutes and 35 seconds. This in turn has done wonders for our data completeness as a research project. The main reason why we wanted to set up these electronic workflows to start with was to enable um, testing of babies and children who are, for example, admitted to hospitals that um, in more remote parts of Australia that do not have clinical genetic services in place. But having put those electronic workflows in place, we were very grateful um, when COVID-19 struck and um, for the past 18 months, we've um, been through a series of lockdowns around Australia, which have meant that, for example, our genetic counsellors have done most of their work from home for, for many months. And for example, parents were not allowed to both be present in the hospital at the same time to provide consent for, for quite a period of time here in Melbourne. So having those electronic workflows in place has enabled our recruitment to continue completely unaffected by the pandemic. And in fact, we're recruiting ahead of schedule. Next slide, please. Having the data in standard interoperable um, formats has also been great for then subsequently um, enabling data sharing and secondary use of the data. So once the laboratory report is issued, for example, all of our curated variants, so the variants that have made it onto the report, are deposited um, in a, another platform built by Australian Genomics called ShareInt. So the purpose of ShareInt is to enable data sharing between our diagnostic laboratories um, with the main um, aim of identifying discrepant variant classifications and enabling resolution between laboratories. We're also working towards uh, bulk deposits from sharing to Clinva, and we hope um, that that will be in place by the end of the year. The genomic data itself is deposited into our genomic data repository, and we're pleased to report that we've just completed our first deposition into the EGA. 
The acute care genomics project um, data is currently being imported into another platform called Sika. So some of you will be familiar with Sika. It was developed by the Broad Institute Center for Mendelian Genomics. And the purpose of the Sika platform is to enable co collaborative analysis of data from unsolved um, cases, primarily to drive novel gene disease discovery. So the Sika platform is linked to the Matchmaker Exchange, for example. We're very pleased to have Daniel MacArthur back in Australia, who has led the de deployment of a local instance of Sika for us, and the acute care genomics project uh, is, the, is the first lot of data deposited into Sika. We have also been very keen to make sure that the data from these families is available for further healthcare use, for example. Um, and our additional findings project has just started. So in this, we offer the opportunity to return to conduct further analysis of the data for healthcare purposes three to six months after the initial results are issued. So for example, both parents have the option of receiving um, the outcomes of analysis for adult onset treatable conditions or for reproductive carrier screening as a couple. And we're all also offering extended analysis for pediatric onset conditions to the child. For this, we've collaborated with Yvonne Bombard from Canada to deploy a local instance of Genomics Advisor. So this is an online platform that um, supports decision making by families. And it's been um, that platform has had quite extensive um, development and testing in Canada. So we're very lucky to have been able to leverage from that pre-existing effort and adapt it for our own use with really um, quite minimal changes. Next slide, please. So in all of this, a project like ours tries to create a virtuous cycle between clinical genomics and research genomics. So on the one hand, to build, so to conduct quite uh, an extensive evaluation of testing and build the evidence base for how something like ultra rapid genomic testing should be incorporated into our healthcare system as standard of care, whilst at the same time making the data available for research to drive improvements in, for example, how we analyze data or our understanding of rare disease or gene discovery, because we know that that is what is going to drive uh, further diagnoses for families in the future. Next slide, please. So really by optimizing all of our workflows and by collaborating very actively um, with others has meant that the project has been able to get up and running very quickly and we have been able to focus our attention really on producing outcomes. So the project's been running for three and a half years. We already have more than 20 publications out. Um, for example, examining the diagnostic and clinical utility of ultra rapid genomic testing, but also the workforce implications, bioethical, um, genetic counseling, health economic, um, implementation challenges and barriers, etc. So we have managed to build a really solid evidence base to inform the implementation of this testing within a healthcare system, a standard of care. At the same time, we have contributed to many natural history studies and gene discoveries, um, again, driving further improvements for rare disease diagnosis. Next slide. And with that, I would like to thank the huge team uh, from all around Australia that's behind the success of this project and happy to take any questions. Slido. Uh, and we've got the first question has come, come up, which I think is one that's dear to our hearts. And it's, uh, um, <laughs> do you see a potential future for collecting whole genome sequencing for all babies in Australia in the future? Uh, um, <clears throat> that's a very hot topic at the moment. So only yesterday, our government um, announced another competitive round of funding to, um, to run some projects of newborn screening. Um, so I, I guess that that's coming in the future, um, but it's very important that it is done in a thoughtful way that, again, um, collects appropriate evidence and evaluation about how it should be performed. Mm. The other thing, oh, so please keep going, Zinitza. I mean, certainly there's been a number of occasions when I have felt frustrated, even though we have pro um, provided the diagnosis within two or three weeks, it's still been too late, and for a treatable condition, it's still been too late to alter outcomes, and that's been very heartbreaking, so yes. Mm. 
So do you see that if um, we had whole genome sequencing as part of newborn screening, it would seem to me that um, you could get the timing down from three days in an, a, a critical care setting. Mm -hmm. So if the data was already pre-existing and we had a specific question and that question could be answered easily within a few hours, that's, um, that would be a very exciting prospect. Mm. So um, next question, uh, what tools do you use um, for analysis of data from the sequences? Uh, I'm not quite sure what that question means. Um, so we use the Dragon Pipeline, for example, for our bioinformatic analysis because that for, for its speed. Um, and then we use, at our laboratory, we use the Alyssa tool from Agilent in order to prioritise variants. Um, and that's linked to a number of other tools. And I think it, it might be useful just the if you could briefly recap the process that it's it's taken from uh, going down from uh, you know I, I think we're pretty pleased with ourselves at two weeks but getting it down to to three days if um, just to give a, a really quick overview of what that was like. Uh, so I think you can get down to two weeks quite easily in most laboratories just by prioritising samples provided that you have sufficient throughput. Um, getting down to three days is a lot harder. So for us, that has meant, for example, switching over to 24-7 um, working for our laboratory um, and um, really processing the samples on demand. So as soon as the samples hit the laboratory, they, they get processed manually and put on the sequencer. And so we we accept that sometimes the sequencer will not be running at full capacity. Um, and that's really what has pushed the um, cost up. Um, beyond that, it's really having the analysis team on standby as soon as the data comes off the bioinformatics pipeline, having a number of us available for immediate analysis. And also around the selection criteria for inclusion in these studies, and that I think is probably contributes to the, the high diagnostic rate, yes. but yes. really is an important step in who you include uh, for this uh, acute care studies. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so at the moment it is a it is a bit of a balance against the cost. So it, it is a um, a resource that we want to use carefully um, because of the cost implications and also the workforce implications. Um, so we developed a set of uh, recruitment criteria involving all the clinical geneticists. Um, that are part of the study from around Australia and a number of other subspecialists, for example, from metabolic um, medicine or neurology. So we have a set of um, criteria, but we also have a, a virtual panel of around 10 specialists that convenes as soon as a case is proposed. And we discuss each case and provide an opinion about whether testing should go ahead, generally within a couple of hours. Mm. So again, um, that's, that's already working remotely as well. Yes. Now, I, I do, I really like this question because I, I think for the non-technical people amongst us, um, it uh, probably one of the barriers of implementing standards is how do you actually start um, to, to implement Global Alliance standards into your workflows? So um, you're a, a clinician rather than a techie as well, Zunit. So would you like to comment on that? But although I would say one of the most important things is having really good Have partnerships. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, well, we've done all of this. So now you look at the finished product, but anyone who's been to this talk um, at the GIF forum over, over the past two or three years will realise that this has been an iterative process for us. So we just very gradually just, um, replaced different components um, of our clinical data capture, for example. Um, first of all, we replaced the the clinical scripted terms with an HPO plugin, you know, and then it was another six months before we implemented the next thing and then the next thing. And eventually we got to a point where we could have a, a finished product. So um, I think iterative development is very important. Having techie friends um, uh, is very important, but also having the opportunity to be part of the clinical and phenotypic work stream and learning from others and also at the gift um, again, looking at examples from other implementations, that's been really valuable. 
Yeah, and I, I think the really good message from there as well is that you can apply one standard at a time. We're certainly looking at how you put standards end to end, but there is really nice fits as you start to, as you're developing your workflow and then to convert it to Global Alliance standards. I think that's really important. Um, so really nice talks, and it's so that's always nice to have a compliment. Are there any additional technologies or methods such as RNA or proteomics being considered to improve diagnostic yield? Again, another yeah. hot topic. <laughs> so yes, at the moment we are incorporating RNA sequencing into our pipeline. At the moment we are doing it three or four months, um, three or four weeks after the initial data analysis, but hopefully by the end of the project it will be concurrent with our whole genome sequencing. We've also established a number of very successful collaborations with research groups around Australia to do functional work, and which people again have been very kind to do that do for us rather quickly, um, particularly in the mitochondrial disease space. Again, we've been able to get a number of variants over the line within a few weeks um, of the initial diagnostic VUS report being issued. Mm, and I think that's important. We fifty percent is great, but it's not good enough. So. I think a, a challenge for all of us now is how we're building transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics into our diagnostic pipeline and how eventually we will get that paid for. But yes. also a, a cohort like this um, and as many of the rare disease cohorts, um, we're able to work with researchers with quite uh, enriched cohorts for gene discovery because all the known genes have been ruled out. So um, we might finish on this um, last question is how many genomes a year do you estimate once we're in steady state uh, for whole genome sequencing for critically ill newborns? And perhaps if you provide that in the context of the population of Australia. So Australia's population is 20 million. Um, no, it's uh, not. 25, 25. 25 million. <laughs> So 20, 25 million, we've thought about this question quite hard because at the moment we're putting a case um, to our government to fund this in an ongoing fashion and we think it is around 350 critically ill babies and children um, and that's assuming uh, maintaining current patient selection criteria um, which are in part driven by the, the high cost. Um, but if the cost was to fall substantially, it would be uh, many more that could potentially benefit uh, in whom the, the yield will be lower. Um, but again, it's it's a balance. Mm. So thanks very much, Sunitza. Um, uh, always keen to see how this acute care genomics is evolving. Uh, putting it down below three days. Uh, but thank you, thank you very much. Now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, who's Ma Gonzalez Porter, uh, who is a staff scientist at the Genomic Institute of Singapore. And she's collaborating with the Precision Health Research Singapore or PRECISE initiative to implement a ten, the 10 year national precision medicine program uh, roadmap um, within Singapore. Um, can we bring Ma into the. Hello, everyone. Let me just quickly check that you can hear me all right. Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your slides, Ma. So, welcome and off you go. Thank you very much, Catherine, for the introduction, and thank you as well for the opportunity to present. So I'm thinking I'm going to use my slot today to talk about three different topics. I'll start off by providing an overview of the work that we're doing in Singapore to establish a precision medicine ecosystem. Then I'll move on to talk about which are the GA4G standards that we've adopted to date. And lastly, I'll mention some of the challenges that we're still facing, as well as some of the standards that we're looking at to be able to address them. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A session at the end of my talk, so happy to address any queries that may arise. Next slide, please. All right, so starting with the first topic. Next, please. Let me start off by saying that everything I'll be talking about today has to do with the Singapore National Precision Medicine Program, or NPM. As you can see at the bottom, this is a long-term effort to try to accelerate the biomedical sector within Singapore specifically across the three areas, research, healthcare, and also economic development. Now, the motivation behind NPM is simple and also unfortunately shared with many other countries. And this is related to the fact that Singapore is seeing an increase in the number of diseased individuals because of its aging population. This is putting a strain onto the healthcare system. 
Now we know that genomics here can help by providing access to more targeted screening, faster diagnosis, and also more personalized treatments. But around that area, there's still a big unmet need. And this is the fact that uh, there's a lack of ethnic diversity in the databases that are used to guide the interpretation of these genomic results. Um, as, as many of you, you you'll know, um, a lot of these data repositories are actually enriched or dominated by data sets that have been derived from Western populations. And this is even more the case for um, when it comes to phenotypic data. Next, please. So having this motivation in mind, uh, we believe that Singapore can help in enriching the diversity that we have in these repositories because of uh, the local diversity that we also see within the population in Singapore, where we have three major ethnic groups, Chinese, Indian, and Malay. And this is really where NPM comes into play. So let me tell you a bit more about the strategy behind NPM. As you can see at the bottom, this is a 10-year program that was started in 2017, and it's been structured in three phases. As of this year, we've completed phase one, and we've also officially kicked off phase two, in which we're targeting sequencing the genomes of 100,000 individuals, among other activities. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a couple of slides. Next, please. The last thing I'd like to mention here around NPM is that this is a whole of government effort, meaning it's driven by the Ministry of Health in Singapore, but also encompasses a number of research and healthcare entities, uh, as you can see in the slide. Next, please. All right, so I talked about uh, one of the achievements this year, which has, which has been to complete phase one. As you can see, phase one has had a number of contributions across multiple areas, and I'm not going to go through all of the contents of this slide, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them. One of the key milestones that you've got in the center of the slide are the contributions towards genomics research. And one of the major achievements of that phase has been to complete the sequencing of 10,000 healthy Singaporeans. That has allowed us to identify millions of variants that were not present in these public repositories I was referring to. And so potentially those are variants specific to the local population that can help drive further genetic uh, analysis. So even though uh, genomic research is a major emphasis in phase one, NPM is also committed to promote the adoption of genomics in the clinic. And in fact, we've already seen a small scale pilot related to the return of results for incidental findings with 25 participants with results returned to date. Also, as you're grasping, uh, phase one has had a strong research drive, uh, but the idea was never for that research to happen in an isolated way. And so there's also been efforts around engaging both with the public and the government bodies, which you can see on the left of, of, on the slide, to make sure uh, there's a promotion of responsible use of genomics data. Next, please. The other achievement this year has been to officially launch phase two. And I'll briefly say that phase two is built upon the same three pillars in which NPM is based, namely health, research, and economic development. Just quickly from the research point of view, the new milestone is to build up a database of 100,000 genomes from the local population. And we intend to combine this genomic data together with phenotypic data. Next, please. As hopefully I've managed to convey, NPM is a multi-institutional effort. I just wanted to take the chance to highlight a couple of institutions that hopefully you'll hear more about. The first one of them is Precise, Precision Health Research Singapore. Now, this is a newly created entity that depends on from the government of health, from the Ministry of Health government. And it's been created with the goal of leading the implementation of phase two. The other institution I wanted to mention quickly is uh, G GIS or the Genome Institute of Singapore. It's one of the many partners that are working towards delivering NPM. And specifically for phase two, uh, will be responsible for looking after data generation and also will be responsible for being the custodians for genomic data. Both of these institutions are already formal members of GA4GH. Next slide, please. All right, so having set the scene for what it is that we're trying to achieve here in Singapore, I'll move on to describing which are the GA4GH standards that we've adopted to date. Next, please. I'll start off by saying that 
the activities within NPM are broad and they encompass multiple of the areas that are already being addressed by GA4GH. Uh, you can see in the slide the data lifecycle diagram, which we've borrowed for GA40H. And it's quite busy, but I'll just mention that hopefully you can see that there's a multiple institutions that are looking after uh, sample collection and consent. Uh, all the way to the bottom, we also have uh, sequencing and data generation, control data access, and to the top right, we've got um, downstream analysis as well as clinical applications of these data. So because it's a complex picture, to simplify things for this talk, um, I'll be focusing on one of the workflows that NPM has been implementing, and that is the genomics research pipeline that we've been using to produce the data for phase one. So focusing on that, next slide, please. I'll provide an overview of what that pipeline is looking like, and I'll emphasize as well the activities where GIS has been involved. Uh, next, please. All right, so the first component to mention for that pipeline has to do with data generation. So here we've been working with different sample providers to collect DNA samples. These DNA samples have been centrally managed by GIS. But the actual sequencing has actually been carried, carried out by a third party. Next, please. Our sequencing provider was returning to us sequencing data in raw format. So at that point, it was GIS turn to take that raw data in BCL format and take it all the way through variant calling. And we perform variant calling both at the single sample level, but also at the cohort level. Next, please. The last component of the pipeline that I wanted to highlight has to do with data access. So once we had these joint co-sets available, those are exposed to a series of data portals, which you can see at the bottom, have different applications. And the one that I wanted to highlight today is Codus. So Codus is our variant browser and provide access to aggregate genomic information in the shape of allele frequencies stratified by ethnicity and gender. You can think of it as uh, similar to NOMAD if you're familiar with that resource. Lastly, control to these data portals, um, access to these data portals is controlled. So for any external par partners that wish to do so, um, they can submit an application through our centralized uh, web portal which will be reviewed by a central data access committee. So this, in a nutshell, covers the end-to-end -end pipeline for genomics research in phase one. Um, and if you can click next, please. There's a couple areas where we've been working towards adopting GA4G standards, so namely covering the activities around data analysis and data access. For data analysis, we've uh, adopted the different file formats to store genomic information, including including CRAM, and for data access, we've implemented a, the Beacon API. Next, please. So for the Beacon API, let me tell you a bit more around that. Um, this has been an effort led by Nathan Yeo and the team at GIS. And you can see that the current version provides access to aggregate data for our SG10K health cohort. So this cohort contains short below 10,000 genomes, close to 180 million sites. And you can see a screenshot of how our Beacon server looks like on the left of the, of the slide. You can see that it supports your basic site queries, as well as more advanced search. And we also support access via the API. Next, please. All right, so with this, I'll move to the last section of my talk, which is describing the future plans um, that we've got in mind in terms of continuing our adoption journey. Next, please. And I'll be doing that again from the perspective of GIS. So keeping in mind the two roles that uh, we've got looking forward in phase two, they are mostly around data generation and being the custodian of genomics data. And we're actually facing challenges in both. Next, please. Next. So I'll just describe the, some of the key challenges around data generation. The first one, as you can see, has to do with the fact that we've got multiple environments where we can launch our analysis. And ideally, we'd like to avoid having to write our pipelines multiple times for each of these environments. So that's why we're looking at WES as a way of writing the pipeline once, being able to submit it, launch it um, in each one of these environments in a rather seamless way. As for the second point, uh, we can see that we've got a similar story around data. Uh, at the moment, we don't have all of our data sets in a single place. Instead, uh, we've got a 
hybrid, a hybrid setup. And so similarly, we're looking at theirs as a possible way of making this data access transparent to source. So th these are the two challenges uh, around data generation. And if you can click next, please. We've got a few more from the data custodian end. Uh, so mostly the challenges here are related to the fact that we're dealing with a large number of samples. And we know this situation is only going to get worse in a way with time. So the question becomes, how do we retain efficient access to the underlying primary data sets when we're working with so many, so many samples, so many data files? In terms of CRAM files, we're looking at HTS GET as a way of being able to efficiently query, not just the whole CRAM, but uh, specifically slices um, that we're particularly interested in. We've, we're also interested in learning more about possible ways to be extending that API for files that are not necessarily already available, um, files that have may have been archived. Um, the other end uh, around being able to perform efficient queries uh, is related to accessing our variant call sets. I mentioned before that we've adopted the VCF format, uh, but we know that this format has some limitations when it comes to when it comes to storing information for large cohorts. And so we're very keen on learning more about the future developments that GA4JG is planning around extending that file format. I'll just say for now that in the meantime, um, we've adopted Hale as well to be able with, to deal with, with so much, uh, with such a volume of data. Mentioned before that uh, data access um, requests are handled by a central committee. And we know that there's a series of GA4G standards that we could adopt that would make that process a bit more standardized and also much more efficient. So in a nutshell, this is the roadmap that we've got in mind um, in terms of standards that we're considering to make the transition to phase two a bit more seamless. Next slide, please. All right, so I'll just like to wrap up by saying that we're looking at GA4GH not just as a source of standards, but also as the potential to collaborate with a community and help or contribute in shaping those standards. So an example of that that has been mentioned before is one of the challenges that we identified early on around the lack of standardized definitions for QC metrics. And that was brought forward to give the Genomics in Health Implementation Forum and since then, we've been able to work together with various national scale initiatives to be able to push this area forward. So if you're interested in learning more, uh, you've got some information on the slide, but please do reach out. Next slide, please. So with this, I'm going to wrap up my talk, uh, just emphasizing three take home messages. First one is um, talking about MPM. Um, this is the Singapore National Precision Medicine Program a long-term effort to try to establish uh, precision medicine uh, locally within Singapore. I've mentioned Precise, a newly created entity that will coordinate the delivery of phase two. And I've mentioned also ways in which we're working with GA4GH and GIF to be able to close some of the gaps and challenges that we're finding around the fact that we're having hybrid architecture, data access, and QC. So next, please. With this, I'd like to wrap up and acknowledge all of our partners and also acknowledge everyone for, for your time. Happy to take any questions. Over to you, Catherine. Amazing progress um, over, over the last couple of years. It's really, really impressive. I invite people to put up questions on Slido, but um, just to kick off, it, it is something that I think we're all facing is making sure that we're increasing um, the diversity uh, in genomic data that it's available. And you showed that very much in the breakdown of what, for example, is in the exact and, and NOMAD databases. And so the cohort that you're, you're bringing together, and I, I note that one of your um, particular interests is um, looking at the genetic diversity of um, the three Asian populations that uh, are, are local to Singapore. So, one, and you've talked about um, the data access and um, and actually the question that I'm about to ask has just come up on Slido, uh, is to really now sharing that more broadly, um, either through a, a resource such as, um, as Nomad, because really increasing 
our centralised access to looking at uh, genomic diversity, I think is incredibly important. Yeah, indeed. Um, as you mentioned, Catherine, yeah, Singapore is in a really good position because you've got in the same geographical space, you've got three different ethnicities, um, major ethnicities, there's other minor ones, but that provides a good opportunity to generate um, a, a, a very precious well, it's a very precious data set. Mm -hmm. Now, as as you're saying, we're we're learning with time. Um, at the moment, we've got a cohort of around ten thousand samples, which we've just uh, managed to analyze all the way through. And indeed, we've just released in the last couple of months uh, these data portals I was mentioning, which do provide access already to aggregate allele frequencies uh, for each one of these ethnicities. In terms of sharing the, or in terms of being able to access that data, I would encourage people to head onto the, uh, the precise link that was available on my slides and submit uh, a data application request through that at the moment. This is the path that we're supporting. Um, as I said, at the moment, uh, these data access requests will be, uh, will be reviewed by a central committee. But in the future, we are exploring indeed, uh, we're very much interested in contributing back to the community. And so we're open to engaging more and being able to share data uh, beyond our confines, indeed. And again, I was interested to see um, how you're applying the Global Alliance standards, um, very similar to uh, Zenitsa's talk as well. It's really starting uh, and using, plugging in the standards, um, but then starting to look at challenges and adding them in. It's, it's really great to see that application. Yeah, indeed. And it, uh, as I think I fully agree with Zornitska. It's, a, it's very much an iterative process. You start with a pipeline setup, you look at the key pain points, and then hopefully you look out for answers within the community to see if someone has already encountered them and if there's already a solution that you can implement. And so hopefully um, it's a win-win. So if there are some standards, uh, we get to adopt them, we get to publicize the work uh, of GA4GH. And if we're having some challenges, hopefully we can also contribute back and guide uh, the development of future standards as well. Great, thank you so much, Ma. We're on time, uh, we're at time. And so I will now move on to our next speaker, but congratulations on all of that progress. Thanks, Catherine. Now, our next speaker who will be Popping up momentarily is Professor Soishi Ogashima, who's a professor in the Department of Informatics uh, for Genomic Medicine uh, in the um, in Tohoku University. And he's leading the development of an integrated database um, for genomics and omics data, health data, clinical data, and phenotypic data being collected as part of a, a prospective cohort study in the Tohoku Medical Megabank project. Um, so I, I think also that um, Soishi is going to touch on the complexities uh, in terms of phenotypic data, um, utilising electronic medical record data from the hospital information system. Um, so welcome and over to you, Soishi. Great to see you. Yes, thank you, Kathleen. So my name is Soishi Oishima from Tokyo University, Demi Japan Project. It is my great pleasure to report updates of, of, of our Gem Japan activities. So next slide. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Gem Japan, uh, Gem Medical Alliance Japan is a GFG driver project pursuing integration of the results of AMED project to realize genomic medicine in Japan. AMED is a funding agency to promote medical research, including the translational science, the activity of Gem Japan, uh, the aggregation of variants and other frequencies, collection and integration of pathogenic variants, contribution to standardization and data sharing, and biobank networking. So the next speaker, uh, Professor Kosaki, is uh, one of the Gem Japan driver project champions. So we have contributed to our uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we have contributed to the GFOG activities uh, through the following work stream and working groups. So the, the, uh, we are joining the participating in the activity of the GFOGH. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. So since the Gem Japan project was designated as a GFOG driver project, we hold a Gem Japan workshop every year, in, uh, which is an invitational workshop. So GFOG developers came to Japan and also major domestic stakeholders, database providers, software developers, and biometrics researchers from both academia and industry joined our workshop. The participants got a broad understanding of the international domestic situations and hot trends, shared experiences, uncovered the problems, the discovered uh, solutions, and implemented them by developing and using the GFOGH tools. So the, the uh, workshop provided the opportunity to connect researchers to each other. Unfortunately, as you know, due to coronavirus, we have been we have not been able to hold the workshop since the Gem Japan Workshop 2020 was held, which was held in February 2020. So we are looking into the possibility of holding a workshop or a webinar this year. Next slide, please. So in, in Gem Japan, we have worked on the responsible framework for uh, the sharing the genomic and clinical data in a research setting. So for smooth data access to genomic and clinical data, both research authentication and research purpose matching with data use restrictions using the data use ontology are important. After researcher is uh, granted access to data, genomic and clinical data uh, should be accessed in a standardized format like ICD and human phenotype ontology. Next slide, please. Thank you. The first important piece of our framework is research authentication. So we are trying to de develop a research authentication system. A researcher is required to register to the IDP with his or her researcher ID. The IDP provides user authentication and the IDP makes inquiries about his or her affiliation institution to the researcher information database. The researcher information database provides researcher affiliation information, including affiliation institution and institu institutional email addresses, which is routine by a researcher institution. It is research institution. So last week we launched a new IDP and last started the collection of researcher IDs. So next we like to try to connect to the researcher information database. So next slide, please. Thank you. And the second important piece is research purpose matching with data use restrictions using data use ontology. As you know, DUO has been developed to automatically match data access restriction and request. To spread implementation of DUO in Japan, we keep working on localization of DUO in Japanese. Also, we keep working on local localization of machine readable consent guideline in Japanese, which is now under review. So Chisato has uh, contributed greatly to this activity. Next slide, please. Thank you. The third important piece is clinical and phenotypic data capture and exchange in standardized format. We keep working on the localization of the HPO in Japanese. And next, how about the promotion uh, of use of HPO as a standard standard medical terminology in each country? So medical terminology has been standardized. In Japan, medical terminology has been standardized by the Terminology Committee of the Japanese Association of Medical Sciences, which consists of the representative from over 130 academic medical societies covering all clinical fields. The, the terminology uh, committee of the Japanese Association of Medical Sciences has a strong interest in HPO, and I have been appointed as a steering member of the terminology committee, and the use of HPO as stand, standard medical terminology in Japan will be addressed in the committee, and I'm very excited about the potential for HPO to be used in a variety of clinical fields in Japan. Also, following the approval of the Phenopacket version 2 as a G4G standard in June for promotion of the use of Phenopacket version 2, so we newly translate the Phenopacket version 2 schema documentation in Japanese. Next slide, please. Uh, how about the progress of real-world implementation of our framework in Japan? First, I'd like to report updates of implementation in the Biobank Network of Japan. I, th I think the next speaker, uh, Professor Kosaki, will introduce his uh, IRAT project. 
So pro, promotion of research and development of genomic medicine utilizing biobanks. So we have developed the biobank network connecting the 12 major biobanks, including Biobank Japan, Tohoku Medical Megabank Project, and the National Center Biobank Network in Japan. So our biobank network is rapidly expanding the number of clinical and genomic data and stores over 1 million species clinical data and 230,000 200, genomic data by 470,000 donors. So we have provided a biobank cross system which enable users to find uh, biospecimen clinical data and the genomic data in our biobank network. Now we are working on the development of one-stop service to, the, uh, to access to the data. Next slide, please. So in our biobank network, we already adapted the GFOG standards. So as for representation of data use conditions, we adapted the two codes. One is IRB and the another is NPU. So and as for exchange format of clinical data, we adapted the panel packets. So today, yeah, today we will update our biobank cross search system for from version two to version three. And this time we will add the very rich cancer clinical data, including the histological type. So we'd like to represent cancer clinical data in panel packet version two. Next slide, please. Thank you. After research authentication, as mentioned, users can search by specimen clinical data and genomic data by disease name, cause, uh, consent information coded in dual codes, and can get the search results. Next slide, please. Thanks. Now, researchers can know the location of clinical and genomic data using the biobank cross search system. So, what researchers need next? So, researchers need to smoothly access to the data they find. So to, toward one-stop access to clinical and genomic data in our biobank network, we are now developing a web-based coordination system. Users can find clinical and genomic data among their biobanks using the biobank cross system, and then users can inquire about and consult with the clinical and genomic data via web system. When users decided to access data, users can prepare the application prepare for application, and our biobank network supports the preparation of the application documents and research plans. So, and also we provide an ethical review service by the Central Institutional Review Board, IRB, uh, which we are establishing. Finally, users can provide access to the data by submitting the application form via web system. Since our biobank network consists of 12 biobanks, so the uh, application procedures and forms are totally different. So we examine the common elements of the application procedure and forms. So then we formulated the common application procedure and web form. It was a process of building a kind of ontology of elements in application procedure and the application form. For example, it was necessary to define the principal in, in, in this investigator and the representative investigator. In Japan, these two terms are have been used interchangeably. So we discuss whether the principal investigator and representative investigator should be considered as the same item or the, as uh, independent items. So by referring the latest ethical guidelines for life science and medical science research in Japan. So as we have started to develop web-based coordination service for our biobank network, it is not that simple. Usually there are a tremendous number of communication between the applicant and the biobank before the data can be used. In this process of communication, the research plan is refined and improved. This process of coordination is one of the so this is the key values of the biobank and it's supported by the passion of the biobank staff for the effective use of data. Next slide, please. By the way, we are, trying, we are trying to make it easier for researchers by providing one-stop service, but we are not trying to omit the data access commit and ethics debut by the IRB required for use of biobanks. So for, from, from time to time, we receive requests from industrial research, research institutes that find uh, these procedures bothersome and want to obtain human data as if they are obtaining ordering the reagents. So on the other hand, at the same time, research institute in the industrial sector sometimes ex ex express their concerns about being denounced by society. That is a framing risk, even though they are complying with the law. So 
These are two sides of, of the same coin. So biobanks receive donation of data from donors with uh, their consent and trust. The, the biobank then responsibly allows the research institutions to use data after SQL reviewing its use. So in addition, the biobank provides consultation to the users to help them improve their research plans. Biobanks not only store clinical genomic data, but also ensure the proper use of the data deposited by donors and provide the consultation for better research. Also, socially an amended privacy act in Japan requires that the data is not merely used based on consent, but that is used for the proper purpose. In other words, biobanks function as a social infrastructure for the responsive sharing of data. This is key value of biobanks, I think. So therefore, we are trying to make visible and formulate the key value of biobank. Next slide, please. So far, I have reported the implementation of biobank network. Using this same scheme, we have developed a cohort network, a cohort network, and cohort cross-site system will be available soon. So uh, next, we would like to contribute to the GA4GH cohort represent representation standard, including cohort registry discovery and computable cohort discovery. Next slide, please. By the way, implementation in the healthcare system is of course important for promoting real world implementation. J4G standards are de facto and forum standards. On the other hand, ISO standards are enforceable international standards, as you know. Each country is required by the WTO to comply with the ISO international standards, which makes ISO international standards mandatory. So ISO TC215 SC1 is, as you know, the new subcommittee for standardization of clinical genomics and phenotypes in the healthcare system. The scope of the, the SC1 is standardization of computable data information knowledge, including their representation, and the metadata for application for the application of mix, including but not limited to genomics, phenomics, and proteomics to support human health and clinical research. Mr. Bron Kisra leads this subcommittee. And in Japan, we established a new national committee, SC1 Japanese Industrial Standard Committee. I'm a chairperson and asked major stakeholders, as academic societies, research institutes, industry association, companies, ministry to participate in our committee. Because ISO standards are the man enforceable standards. So the, the, our committee is a national organization that brings together a wide range of stakeholders from academia to industry, from genomic medicine to medical informatics, and from rare disease to cancer medicine to gather the opinion of the stakeholders in Japan. And we have asked the, we have worked on the cross SDO activities among GA4, GH, at ISO, and HL7 towards real world implementation. Actually, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, actually, FENO packet has been proposed as the international standards by RINGI, J4GH. So FENO packet will be the, the first standard published in J4GH and ISO. Along with the uh, approval process of J4GH, our committee uh, ISO C1 contributed to develop the international standard of, of FENO packets. And our Japanese committee made 35 comments, most of them with most of which were reflected in the final version. So now Feno Packet version two in the final final stage of the I international standardization as ISO DIS 4454. We believe the collaboration between G4GH and ISO is very effective for standardization in healthcare system, not in research settings. So G4GH can develop an effective standard in a short period of time, prototyped by leading developers in the field. And ISO can coordinate the standard by gathering the opinion of a wide range of stakeholders in each country. I would like to thank Japanese committee members, especially Professor Teruhiko Yoshida from National Cancer Center and Mr. Hideo Nakagome from Fujitsu Limited Company, which has a top share of the electronic medical record market. Next slide, slide please. Okay, so this is the last slide of my presentation. So real world implementation is very important. So we need to think about the uh, responsive data ecosystem. So we have to draw a grand design right now to store use of gen genomic clinical data for every single citizen in healthcare system. So, uh, so we need to have open discussion to realize the responsive data system in clinical systems. From this perspective, co cooperation between G4GH and ISO and as well as H7 will be very important. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Much for a fantastic. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, and it's always amazing to see the progress that's been made over the last couple of years. And I'm very interested in your concept of the biobank as as the center, um, the center of your genomics community, uh, and how it feeds in from both research, clinical, and and industry, which I think is a, a really wonderful model that. Um, I hope many countries are going to be able to emulate. Um, what what do you see in terms of the the biobanking of what type of studies that it's going to be able to it's it's going to make possible? So you mean the research type of research? Uh, yes, what type of research it's going to make possible that wouldn't uh, have been possible before? So, yeah, so we accept to so many kinds of the research types. To the biobank, so 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 that's a, so applicants have so many wide background, and so they have many research purposes. So that we need to adapt to the so many types of <laughs> research. So of course, mm -hmm. including GBAS and the uh, how they say so in one one single gene research. So it it depends on the applicant. So but uh, we need to adapt to the, the the many kinds of demands from the research institute. Mm. And just just the last question before we move on is uh, I note that a number of your partners, both in the ISO committee and with the biobank, are from industry and from um, from from pharma. Uh, is there any? Do you make sure when, within your biobank, um, do all patients or participants consent to share their information with industry, or is or is there a um, uh, just a subset that do that. Uh, okay, so yeah. So you mean that's uh, if, uh, so? Uh, uh, could you please? Uh, I'll read. I'll read yeah. The um, the, are the the partnerships with the industry very active? Yeah. Because there's um, there is we find that uh, we need to get specific consent in terms of sharing uh sharing data with industry uh-huh and whether you found any difficulties there okay so yeah yeah so it depends on the biobanks but uh, the the this recently so our many most of the biobanks have a, a very good inform how they say good informed consent for the yeah. for utilizing the data in, in in the industry so but the old type of biobanks so so the the how they say the guideline is the the old old biobank have a informed consent based on the old ethical guideline and the old uh privacy act so that's uh, it's sometimes not not good for use of the industry yeah yeah I, and I, I think that's a really good point because what i think we're finding as well in australia is um make it, it's it's a lot easier as you say using the the new consent tools now that we've looked um particularly with work like global alliance look at irresponsible sharing but making sure yeah. we've got um all of those levels of consent in place whether it's used for clinical um, research or in partnerships with industry. I think that's something really important that we're all facing. So thank yeah. you so much yeah. for a really wonderful presentation and congratulations on the progress. And we're thank now you. going to move to the um, last speaker of this section, uh, this section uh, Dr. Kenjiro Kosaki, who's the director for the Center of Medical Genetics at the Kyo University School of Medicine in Tokyo. Um, and uh, Welcome, welcome, Kenjiro, and we really look forward to your presentation. Uh, hello, um, I'm Kenjiro Kosaki from Keio University, and I'm the champion of Gem Japan, which was introduced by uh, Professor Ogishima. And I like to talk about uh, real initiative on rare and undiagnosed diseases and the real world use of phenol packets. And I like to introduce our real world use of genomics in Japan, national project. Since the beginning of the project, information on human phenotype has been extensively used together with the genotype information. 
Recently, we are storing the, storing the genotype phenotype information in the form of phenopacket. Next slide, please. The project uh, will be uh, spelled as IRUD or as an abbreviation, a Japanese nationwide undiagnosed disease program. In the IRAD program, patients are evaluated at more than 30 clinical sites located nationwide for eligibility screening for enrollment. Patient samples are sent to one of the five analysis centers together with the clinical information. Next slide, please. As shown on the slide, uh, more than 5,000 patients have been enrolled. And the di diagnostic rate has been more than 40%. And uh, more than 30 new disorders have been identified through the program. Next slide, please. As an illustrative sample, I'd like to introduce a PDG receptor beta related overgrowth, which was discovered through the project. We uh, evaluated two patients with overgrowth, scoliosis, and loose skin. These two patients were unrelated, but had very similar clinical features as shown on the slide. Both patients had a de novo heterozygous missense mutation in the PDG receptor beta gene. And the two patients had the very same amino acid substitution as shown on the slide. And later, uh, this mutation was shown to be of gain of function type by, Bel by a Belgian group. Next slide, please. Through matchmaker exchange system and other systems, more than 10 patients have been identified worldwide. Overgrowth, scoliosis, and thin skin are consistent features. We also learned that uh, dilatation of the cerebral and coronary arteries develop over the uh, two decades of life, and that this annulism is considered to be critical. As we can learn from this example, we really have to uh, keep describing the phenotype type of the new disorders. This condition is now considered as a recognizable pattern and appeared in the traditional textbook of a multiple congenital malformation syndrome in the newest edition. Next slide, please. Furthermore, an international consortium for pharmacologic treatment of this new syndrome has been formed. As I mentioned, the PDG receptor vera mutation is gain of function type and the tyrosine kinase inhibitor imatinib, imatinib was expected to be effective. As you know, imatinib has been already approved as a drug for leukemia. To date, uh, five countries have already formed a team to start a trial on this new drug. And uh, there has been a published paper from Norway that this imatinib is actually effective against this new disorder. Next slide, please. Our project has been accumulating phenotype information for the past six years with the help of dedicated software, IRAD Exchange, which is a modified version of the software patient archive developed by Dr. Tudor Groza. We can store phenotype information together with the genotype information. Next slide, please. In order to facilitate entry of phenotype information in the HPO format by physicians and uh, genetic counselors, we have completed cross-lingual adaptation of the IRAD exchange system. In the new system, medical terms are entered in Japanese in a direct way and uh, the Japanese language is directly converted into HPO format. And the introduction of this new system has facilitated the use of HPO, HPO very significantly. Next slide, please. The HPO information and associated candidate gene names are shared uh, on a national scale. And the selected data are provided to the international community through the matchmaker exchange network as shown on the slide. Next slide, please. 
uh, through such international collaborations, we have identified several new disorders as shown on the slide. And we also have a collaborative network together with the basic scientists in Japan. And we have used the HPO and other uh, phenotype ontology terms to exchange uh, phenotype information among ourselves. And uh, we have been collaborating with uh, Drosophila scientists and um, Zebra fish scientists very uh, significantly. Next slide, please. As we showed, we can solve about 40% of the cases, but the remaining 60% needs to be dealt with. And the unsolved cases have accumulated over the years. We have occasionally reanalyzed the samples in view of newly published articles on new disease causative genes. This reanalysis has been performed manually by clinical geneticists. However, this process of reanalysis has been very laborious, and we have planned to apply computer-based approach instead. Next slide, please. We chose the software Lilical, which was this developed by Dr. Robin, Peter Robinson's group. Lilical calculates the likelihood ratio of each observed or excluded phenotypic abnormalities. If genotype data is available, likelihood ratio are additionally calculated for the genotype information. In contrast to previous approaches based on semantic similarity, Lyrical provides an estimate of the post-test probability of candidate diagnosis. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, phenotype data from our project IRAD has been stored in the HPO format and the genotype data in VCF format. IRAD Exchange has the capability to export combined phenotype genotype data in pheno packet format. Because there is an incompatibility issue between pheno packets version one and version two, the software pheno packet generator was used for the generation of the pheno packet data. Next slide, please. I'd like to show you an example. We first reanalyzed a patient who was unresolved by manual analysis of the exome data. Exome analysis was originally performed in 2012 and the disorder was reported next year. So we were not able to make the diagnosis on the initial attempt. According to that reanalysis by the software Lyrical, the top ranked disease was Beaker Wolf syndrome caused by Zitz. ZC4H2 mutation. Post-test probability was 70%. Review of the chart and the re-examination of the patient indicated that the prediction by Lyrica software was indeed appropriate. Next slide, please. As I showed, as I mentioned, each phenotypic feature is scored by uh, likelihood ratio as shown on the slide. So we can actually see if the prediction is uh, accurate from a phenotypic standpoint as well. Next slide, please. Then I try to uh, test whether the new syndrome I we discovered can actually be diagnosed by lyrical. And indeed, uh, the diagnosis was top ranked through the lyrical analysis. Next slide, please. In order to better characterize the performance of lyrical in a systematic way, we reanalyze 100 cases that have already been resolved by our IRAD project. The overall result is shown on the slide. It is great to learn that lyrical placed the correct gene in the first place in 52% of cases and place the correct diagnosis in the top five rank in 69%. Uh, uh, next slide, please. The post-test probability was within the range of 19 to 100% in 33 cases out of these 84 cases. 
And uh, it is, the performance is quite impressive. Next slide, please. In concurrent with the IRAD project, we have started a, a critically ill newborn babies whole genome sequencing analysis project in our country. So this is uh, more uh, difficult because the phenotype information is less, in, less informative in newborn babies. According to the lyrical analysis, as shown on the right side of the slide, Lyrical placed the correct gene in the first place only in 36%. So we need to make some improvements in this aspect. Next slide, please. In conclusion, undiagnosed diseases program is underway in Japan. More than 5,000 patients have been observed, uh, analyzed. GA4GH approved standards such as HPO, VCOF, and pheno packets have been utilized. New disorders have been identified and new therapies are being developed even. Reanalysis of unresolved cases have been an issue. Phenotype-driven prioritization of candidate genes and diseases by lyrical represents a promising approach. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Kenjiro. It's um, a wonderful uh, presentation to have as the last one in the session with such a great focus on research and gene discovery uh, and how you've applied it. And uh, I, I just noted in your bio that you've been um, focusing on this area for over 20 years. So it must be very exciting for you uh, to have all of these new new tools to play with. Now, um, the uh, question, any questions please on, on uh, Slido. And the first question that's come up is, how did you identify the new disease using FINA packets in the IRUD project? Basically, uh, we perform case matching, just like matchmaker exchange. Uh, we try to um, see if there is any match on a national scale first, and that was how. But the new disorder I introduced was uh, identified in my own clinic without using any kind of computer uh, software. <laughs> It's often the way, <laughs> less so these days. Um, what really impressed me in your talk as well is um, how you've adapted tools such as um, phenopackets and with the translations into to Japanese of all the HPO terms, um, which is great in terms of how now Japanese data can be, um, you know, it contributed to something like matchmaker exchange. I was wondering if you could give us an idea of how long it took um, to to translate um, all of those HPO terms, and how you um, you know how you were able to achieve that. Uh, we have used two uh, approaches. One is the um, translation of the. Uh, standard terminology defined by the Japanese uh, Medical Society uh, in, into HPO terms. This was performed by a Professor Ogishima who presented uh, before me. So this is yeah. a simple translational yeah. table. The second approach was using the Google Translate. We uh, translate the Japanese medical notes into English first and convert it into uh, HPO through uh, system developed by the Australian scientist Fusa Groza. Both uh, approaches work uh, equally well, I think. Yeah, no, and it's it's fantastic to have that. And just so that our audience knows um, that the HPO terms and phenopackets through the Clinical and Phenotype Working Group um, has now been uh, translated into, I don't know the exact number, um, but multiple languages internationally. So uh, again, it's another example where we focus on genomic standards in terms of all speaking the same language, but um, it's great now that from a, a clinical phenotype perspective, which as you've beautifully demonstrated, um, is just so important uh, in terms of using genomic data. 
So thank you so much. And we're um, at the end of this first session. And we um, the next session is going to start um, on the hour. So because I know we're all in uh, different time zones. Um, so please um, rejoin us um, for the session um, of engaging with um, underrepresented communities. And that session will be chaired by uh, Peter Goodhand. And you've now all got a 16 minute break before we reconvene. So uh, have a biological break, get a cup of coffee, and we'll see you on the hour. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to all. Well done.